we began our three-week-long escorted tour of China in the capital, Beijing. On a rather showery morning, we set off on our first visit to this temple complex. There's no single temple building, but a number of different halls and gates, and dominated by this pagoda-like hall in the centre. Our visit to Beijing coincided with a three-day public holiday, the Mid-Autumn Festival. The park surrounding the Temple of Heaven was packed with local people. The most popular activity was playing cards, but more physical games were also quite popular. In this adaptation of Tai Chi, the aim is to keep a ball balanced on your racket as you perform various dance manoeuvres. After an early lunch, we visited the Forbidden City, entering across the moat and through the northernmost gate. This section of the Forbidden City is where the Emperor's family used to live, and is characterised by relatively small buildings and ornamental gardens. The most impressive feature of all the buildings is the colourful and ornate roofs. Our tour was run by Wendy Wu, and there were 22 of us in the group. We had a national guide, a very nice Chinese lady called Maggie, who stayed with us throughout the entire three weeks, and were joined by a local guide in each of the different cities we visited. As you move southwards through the city, the buildings become progressively larger, and more ceremonial, and with large outdoor spaces between them. Passing through this huge gate at the southern edge of the Forbidden City led us directly into Tiananmen Square. In the lead-up to the Chinese National Day on the 1st of October, they were decorating the square with many thousands of pot plants. The scale of Tiananmen Square is very impressive but most of the surrounding buildings aren't terribly interesting, having been designed in a very austere style by Soviet architects. Despite its six large ring roads, Beijing has badly congested traffic. They don't believe in leaving any gaps between vehicles when they're driving, and we saw quite a few minor bumps. The coloured lights on these signs show the degree of congestion on the surrounding roads. On our second morning in Beijing, we woke to a lovely clear blue sky, and drove out of the city to one of the renovated sections of the Great Wall. This section of the wall climbs steeply out of a valley. It was quite hard work walking along it. The steps were uneven, but mostly quite high, and it became quite hot in the sun. Margaret managed just over a thousand steps, and I carried on for a further 300 or so to the end of the section that you're allowed to walk along. On our way back into the city, we stopped off at the Olympic site to have a look at the main athletic stadium and the swimming venue. Here, as at most places we visited, we Westerners were a tiny minority and objects of curiosity to the Chinese. They were invariably very friendly though, and we never once felt uncomfortable. We were given two hours to look around this market for fake goods. I quickly tired of it and went out for a walk and took a trip on the very impressive Beijing Metro. A trip to anywhere cost 20 pence in lovely clean air-conditioned trains. Hutongs are neighbourhoods of traditional housing crisscrossed by narrow alleyways. There are a few of them left now, most having been flattened to make way for high-rise apartment blocks. As well as a rickshaw ride, we were taken for lunch in one of the family homes. Our final visit in Beijing was to the Summer Palace, which is situated about 10 miles northwest of the city. The information signs on most of the buildings here told us how they'd been rebuilt following their destruction by English and French troops in the Opium Wars of the mid 19th century. 
It was another warm sunny day, and there was a lovely atmosphere. The grounds were packed with thousands of local families enjoying it out. It was quite striking that we'd rarely see children together, just parents with the one child that most of them are limited to. Our three days in Beijing made a wonderful start to our tour of China. All our meals were included, and the quality of the food was good. For lunch and dinner, we were taken to a different restaurant every time, and there was a good variety of dishes. On the evening of our third and final day in Beijing, we were taken to see an acrobatic show in a theatre near the hotel. And then it was early to bed to prepare for our 5:45 a.m. departure the following morning. From Beijing, we took a one and a half hour comfortable flight in a modern Boeing aeroplane to Xi'an, capital of the Shanxi province. It was raining quite heavily when we arrived, so we started off with a visit to the Shanxi History Museum. It's a modern museum, very well laid out and with English explanations. And it provided our first sight in China of the famous terracotta warriors, as well as lots of other objects dating back over the past two and a half thousand years. The small goose pagoda, which we visited later on that day, is not particularly decorative, but it's very impressive that they were able to construct it more than twelve hundred years ago. The top two stories collapsed in an earthquake about a thousand years ago. In the grounds of the pagoda, a calligrapher was demonstrating his art. Here, supposedly, he's writing Margaret in traditional Chinese characters. On our first evening in Xi'an, we were treated to a dinner of lots of different types of dumplings, whilst being entertained by music and subsequently dance, dating from the 8th century Tang Dynasty. Of course, our main reason for visiting Xi'an was to see the terracotta army. The whole area was just farmland until 1974, when some farmers discovered some figures while digging a well. The main excavation site is Pit One. The army of life-size pottery figures was made to guard the tomb of Qin Shi the first emperor of China over 2,200 years ago. The emperor's tomb that the army is protecting is about a mile from the pits containing the army, so there's a vast area thought to contain other treasures as yet undiscovered. Only a small portion of the army has been excavated so far, and they don't want to excavate some because they don't know how to preserve it. The figures were painted in vivid colours, but these colours disappear soon after exposure to air. Tea is the main drink in China, and the making and serving of it in the tea houses is quite a show. The teas are mostly green teas. After lunch on our second day in Xi'an, we were taken to a factory and showroom where they make terracotta army figures in the traditional way. Xi'an was an important city on the Silk Road and as a result has a sizable Muslim community. Apart from the prayer hall in one corner and some signs in Arabic, you wouldn't know that this Chinese garden is a mosque. The central part of the city of Xi'an is completely enclosed by a rectangle of walls about nine miles long. We had a walk along one stretch of the wall and came across a man playing with his spinning top. In the evening we went for a foot massage. It was very thorough, taking over an hour, and pleasant enough, but neither Margaret nor I thought it had any lasting effect.
We very much enjoyed our two days in Xi'an, despite rather poor weather. As expected, the terracotta army was the highlight, but the city walls are very impressive, and it was really interesting wandering around the Muslim quarter. From Xi'an, we flew southeast to Wuhan, then took a four hour coach journey to Yichang, where we started our cruise along the Yangtze River. It was a four night cruise, travelling 400 miles upstream from Yichang to Chongqing. These cruises used to be all about seeing the spectacular scenery in three gorges along this section of the river. But the construction of the Three Gorges Dam has caused the water level to rise over 150 metres, making the scenery in the gorges somewhat less spectacular. But of course the dam itself has now become a major attraction. This model shows the layout, with the locks on the right hand side and the dam itself on the left. They are also constructing a lift that will allow smaller ships to pass the dam much more quickly than the four hours it takes to pass through the locks but the lift won't be ready for another two years yet. There are two parallel sets of five lock chambers. Each chamber is 280 metres long, only slightly smaller than those on the Panama Canal. Our boat, the Victoria 1, was quite similar to these ones you can see ahead of us and there was room for six boats like this in the lock. It works in exactly the same way as the Bingley Five Rise locks on the Leeds and Liverpool Canal, although of course the scale and the degree of automation are something else entirely. Our boat had a capacity of about a hundred passengers. It was clean and perfectly comfortable, although it could have done with some renovation. We were taken on an excursion in smaller boats up a tributary of the Yangtze, the Shenong Stream, where I think the scenery would have been much better had it not been raining and misty. Before the rise in water level caused by the dam, the boatmen used to have to work really hard to row against the current. In places they had to use ropes to pull the boats up over the rapids, but this is just done as a demonstration for tourists now. An unusual custom of the local people here, over a thousand years ago, was to place their dead in what are called hanging coffins, perched precariously on ledges high above the river. Everywhere we went ashore, there was always a row of stall holders looking to sell their wares. As well as cheap tourist souvenirs, there was always plenty of fresh food available for sale. Hygiene standards weren't always what we're used to, as with this chap smoking while he's preparing the food, but once it's freshly stir-fried it's probably safe to eat. Feng Du, which we visited on the last day of our cruise, is made up of a number of temples and shrines dedicated to the afterworld. It's an extremely popular attraction. There's a cable car that runs from the river to the top of the hill, but we chose to walk. There was a strange mix of symbols from different religions and quite a few Buddhas in Chinese settings. There are lots of statues of demons representing a Chinese view of hell to serve as a reminder of what might happen to them should they misbehave in this lifetime. And as always, at the top of the hill, a large pagoda. The Yangtze River is an important artery connecting the southwest of China with Shanghai and the sea. As well as large ships carrying dozens of lorries, there are regular hydrofoil services for passengers. We passed some large cities on the cruise. Pretty unattractive looking, with row upon row of closely packed high-rise apartment blocks. Generally speaking, we noticed less pollution in China than I'd expected. But this enormous steelworks was an exception. For several miles either side of it, visibility was much poorer than everywhere else.
Chongqing, where we finished our cruise, is the economic centre of the Upper Yangtze area. The Chongqing metropolitan area has a population of more than 30 million people. Since the construction of the Three Gorges Dam, there's been a significant increase in the number of wet and misty days along this section of the river, so I suspect our experience was typical rather than particularly unlucky. We found this cruise section of our tour to be interesting and comparatively relaxing, but the scenery wasn't as dramatic as we'd hoped. We had a long coach journey from Chongqing to Chengdu, which is the capital of the Sichuan province and famous for its panda breeding and research centre. Our hotel was very close to the modern city centre, where, apart from the language difference, the shops are very much like the ones we're used to. But just a short walk away from the city centre were streets full of more interesting local shops. On our first evening in Chengdu, we went to a Sichuan opera performance, in which the performers each play many parts, rapidly changing their face masks to indicate a change in role. About 60 miles south of Chengdu, in the town of Lishan, is an enormous Buddha carved into sandstone rock overlooking the river. It took the local people almost 100 years to complete, over 1200 years ago, and stands 230 feet high. Even the feet are 26 feet long. Unfortunately, it was raining heavily while we were there, and it was impossible to get good shots of it. Huanglong Shi is an old town that's been restored so completely that it didn't seem real to us. It felt more like a theme park. Still, it was quite attractive, and it was fascinating to watch the Chinese enjoying themselves. In the tea rooms, cards and mayong were very popular. And if you felt like getting your ears cleaned out, then that was fine too. There were some very nice sweets on sale, including something like nougat, made very energetically. Our first day in Chengdu was Margaret's birthday, and at dinner she was served the traditional longevity noodles. Quite tricky to eat with chopsticks. The following morning, we visited the main attraction in Chengdu. They didn't allow photographs of the baby giant pandas, but several older ones were on show. Rather like koalas, they get so little nutrition from their food that they have no spare energy and spend almost all their lives either sleeping or eating. For an extra fee, they allow you to cuddle a panda, and Margaret did this as a birthday treat. They wouldn't let me in just to watch, so one of the others in our group, who was also taking part, kindly agreed to video Margaret's experience. We were very surprised by the size of the panda, a two-year-old. The panda is given honey-coated bamboo to keep it happy while being manhandled. Although giant pandas get all the publicity, this centre also has red pandas. They're completely unrelated. Giant pandas are a type of bear, whereas red pandas are more like raccoons. A feature of any group tour of China is that in every city you get taken to some sort of factory, given a quick demonstration, and then left in a showroom for about an hour, with nothing to do but shop. 
Seeing the pandas was definitely the highlight of our visit to Chengdu, but seeing the great Buddha was also well worthwhile. We took an evening flight from Chengdu to Guilin, arriving at our hotel after midnight and departing just eight hours later for a four-hour cruise south along the Li River. This area of China is noted for its spectacular scenery, with lots of rock peaks left behind after the erosion of all the surrounding soft rock over hundreds of thousands of years. We were very lucky with the weather. It was a wonderful warm sunny day with good visibility. The local people use a lot of these rafts made of thick bamboo poles. They float extremely low in the water, looking as though they're sinking. The Chinese like poetic names and evidently have very good imaginations. Almost every rock peak is named after something that the shape of the rock supposedly looks like from a certain angle. Examples of some we saw but didn't recognise are River Snail Hill, the Painted Hill of Nine Horses, Celestial Being, and Penholder Hill. The fishermen here use cormorants to catch the fish for them. They fish at night, we'll see a demonstration of that shortly. During the day the cormorants are kept tied up alongside the boats. Our cruise finished in the town of Yangshuo. It was a really busy and buzzing place, even late into the evening. We had a bit of free time the next morning to wander around Yangshuo. There was the usual traffic chaos. And a fascinating local food market. The southern Chinese are especially fussy about the freshness of their food. Quite a large section of the food market was full of live animals of various types, including some that we would not consider eating. On the drive from Yangshuo back to Guilin, we stopped at a farming village set amongst idyllic scenery. The farming is no longer communal. Each farmer has his own plot of land. The government guarantees a minimum price for each crop, but the farmers are encouraged to sell their produce privately and get better prices. The political system may be communist, but the business environment certainly isn't. We were introduced to a local family and shown inside their very basic house. A group of children quickly appeared, eager to be photographed. The one-child policy doesn't apply in rural areas, so it's quite likely some of these are brothers and sisters. Just north of Guilin is the 250-yard long reed flute cave. A sound and light show helps show off the ornate stalactites, stalagmites, rock columns and pools with wonderful reflections. Guilin itself is a modern and affluent looking city. We climbed the 500 steps of the folded brocade hill to get these lovely views. That evening we were given a demonstration of cormorant fishing. They go out after dark with the light on the front of the boat to attract the fish. Each fisherman has three or four cormorants, which swim in front of the boat and dive for fish. When a cormorant catches a fish, it climbs back onto the boat and waits. They have twine tied around their throats so that they can't swallow the fish. The fisherman then retrieves the fish from the cormorant's throat into his bucket. At the end of a night's fishing, the cormorants have the twine removed from their throats and are allowed to eat some of the fish. Wandering around Guilin and the other cities we'd been to, both in the evenings and the mornings, it was a common sight to see groups of Chinese people engaged in Tai Chi, exercise and dancing of various sorts. Of all the places we visited in our three weeks in China, the Li River and the nearby farming community definitely had the most spectacular scenery. 
From Guilin, we flew to Shanghai, situated at the mouth of the Yangtze River. We then took a coach about 60 miles northwest to the town of Suzhou, which is noted for its gardens and its canals, and is sometimes referred to as the Venice of the East. All the places we visited in China were nicely illuminated at night, and lovely to wander around. The next morning we took a trip on the canals, passing both the old part of the city and also some quite modern western looking housing. The Grand Canal is the largest man-made waterway in the world, linking Shanghai to Beijing. The canal boat dropped us off at a silk factory for some more enforced shopping although actually I found the demonstration here quite interesting. The cocoons from the silkworms are steamed to soften them before the incredibly fine thread is unwound on these machines. Intricate patterns are woven on these looms which are controlled by complex sequences of punched cards. The gardens in Suzhou were established in the 16th century and they include a lot of finely furnished and decorated pavilions. Our next stop was Shanghai city centre, with a brief tour of the museum, and then on to the Bund. The Bund is where western banks and trading companies built their offices in the 19th century. And directly across the river is the new Chinese business district of Pudong. Crossing one of the tunnels to Pudong, and then taking a lift to the observation deck on the 88th floor of the Jinmao Tower, gave us magnificent views over the city. In the centre of the tower is this spectacular atrium of the Hyatt Hotel. A mile and a half away, but still overlooked by the tallest Pudong skyscraper, is an old district of Shanghai with ornamental gardens, shops and tea houses. Zigzag bridges are very popular because the Chinese believe that evil spirits can't turn corners. 1st October 1949 was not only Margaret's birth date, but also the birth date of the People's Republic of China. There were banners and posters celebrating the 61st anniversary of these two events in many places we visited. We returned to the river between the Bunt and Pudong after dark for a boat trip to view the impressive illuminations. The sides of these skyscrapers must surely be the largest advertising billboards in the world. Connecting Shanghai City to its main airport is a high-speed train which is suspended over its tracks and propelled by magnetic levitation. It took us just 7 minutes to cover the 32 miles and we reached a top speed of 268 miles per hour. Queuing for half an hour to get into the World Expo didn't seem too bad when we considered that over half a million people were visiting just that day. The queues to get inside the national pavilions were just too long for us to bother with. But wandering around looking at them all from the outside was fascinating and it didn't seem too crowded. The organised part of our tour had finished the previous evening. Many of our group had early morning flights, but ours was late evening, giving us this extra day to explore. We took the metro from our hotel down to the World Expo site. It was cheap, comfortable and very straightforward. The British pavilion was stunning, much smaller than many of the others, 
but a very interesting and innovative design. It's made out of 60,000 glass rods. Fortunately, we'd been tipped off in advance that we wouldn't need to queue to go into the British Pavilion. We just showed our British passports and got straight in. Inside the end of each of the 60,000 glass rods are seeds from the Millennium Seed Bank. The other symbols of Britain that they chose to showcase to the world were a waxwork of David Beckham and these traditional canvas deck chairs. It was a great end to a terrific three-week trip, which gave us an excellent overview of a really fascinating country.